Ben Woodruff here with another falconry video. Today's video we're talking about the molt and the reverse molt. Uh, there's kind of two subjects that are tied together. Molting and understanding it is kind of important to falconry. It may not be as exciting as watching videos of falcons knocking pheasants out of the air, but it's important to know. So first let's talk a little bit about feathers. Uh, you may not be aware of this but feathers are technically scales. Uh, they've just been repurposed. Every bit as much as flower petals are, are advanced specialized leaves. They're chemically the same. Feathers and scales are both made out of keratin and they're laid in the same mathematic structures. We've actually done genetic research on chickens and identified which genes turn on and off the code to make uh, it grow into a feather or grow into a scale, like a leg scale. It's just pretty amazing to see that, 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 that just a slight difference can repurpose a feather. But this is one of the, the brilliant things about birds. There's a lot of other flying animals. Things like insects and bats and flying squirrels and sugar gliders and and in the old days pterosaurs right that lived contemporary with dinosaurs all of these animals uh, have a wing that doesn't get replaced if it gets damaged you're out of luck but birds having feathers the feathers can be replaced and they are every year now some birds will have multiple molts in a year with special breeding plumage that's not the case with birds of prey. Birds of prey, uh, they'll have, most birds of prey will have juvenile colors and they'll lose feathers once they're a year old and get adult colors. And then every summer after they'll get a new set of adult colors. Now, some birds, bigger birds, condors, large vultures, eagles, this might be three, a three to six year process where every year they'll get a new set, a full new set, but you have baby colors second year baby, third year baby, fourth year, and finally by fifth year, uh, they have adult colors. Uh, the easiest example for people to recognize is a bald eagle. They start off all brownish chocolate black, and then by the time they're five, they're a full white head, white tail, brown body, and in between, they have a mix of feather colorations that get them to that point. Now, <clears throat> in the wild, birds typically molt in the summertime. The reason for this that is there is food everywhere. It's not as cold, so you're not burning through your calories as quickly to keep warm, and animals are having babies. So food is plentiful. There's green plants for insects to eat. Uh, it, it, little birds eat those insects. There's more birds for you to hunt. And same thing with mammals. Mammal, all the world is producing offspring, so food is more readily available for a bird of prey. Now, if you're a bird of prey, that's also the time of year you want to raise your own young because you have enough food available to capture and feed your offspring as well as enough extra food to grow a new set of feathers. These feathers are not just randomly lost. They happen in order. So if you look at the wing feathers or the tail feathers, it'll be like these two leave and start growing, then the next two, then the next two, then the next two, and they'll just it, it mathematically perfect. So the same day, these two will fall out and start growing and then, then the next two. It's really a beautiful process and a beautiful system. In the wild, this process takes typically longer than it does in captivity. You, uh, we, as a falconer, what we typically do is give a richer diet and the bird doesn't have as much, many caloric demands. They're not having to fly as far to get food. So because of that in captivity, your bird is going to molt quicker. Once the molt starts, it will lose feathers and gain new feathers more quickly. So this is both good and bad. The good and bad of that for a wild bird is if you only are missing a few feathers at a time, you can still fly and be fairly agile. And any loss to your agility is okay because a lot of the prey of your hunting is, the, the, a lot of the prey that you're hunting is new animals that hatched or were born that year and are inexperienced. It's a lot easier to capture uh, a baby bird than a seasoned bird that has evaded falcons for years. So in captivity though, they lose so many feathers that typically they're not suitable to fly in the summer. Now, there's more understanding that you have to realize about this. There's, we basically do not have falconry as a summertime sport. You can hunt a bird in the summer, 
There's people who do it uh, on non-native species like uh, English sparrows, European starlings that are pest species in America. Uh, you can hunt, uh, I know people who have hunted golden eagles through the summer on unprotected jackrabbits. So it is doable. And people always ask, why don't you normally do that with your bird? Well, not me personally, but why do falconers not normally fly in the summer? First of all, it's hot and miserable. Most birds of prey don't like the heat. Second of all, if they are in the middle of the molt and you fatten them up for that molt, then they are at risk of breaking feathers. You want them to have as little stress as possible as those feather follicles are growing in new shafts and you don't want to cause any damage or stress to that. And then the, of course, the last reason is most of the game you are hunting can only legally be hunted in the fall and winter. Uh, the reason is they're having their own offspring. So hunting laws are built based off of those ethics. The idea is, hey, you want to hunt ducks or pheasants? Well, in the summer, the ducks and pheasants are having their babies. You don't want to take away somebody's mom or dad. In the fall and winter, in nature, it's every man for himself, right? Every you, Nobody's being taken care of by a parent. Nobody's a parent. Nobody's a child. Everybody's just a free-ranging individual. And so hunting in that instance, you're not... Uh, disrupting the reproductive cycles of prey species. Again, that's not a big deal if you're hunting species that are either invasive or uh, unprotected, like jackrabbits or starlings or sparrows. But that's one of the main reasons why we don't uh, fly them in the summer. What triggers this in birds? What triggers it and lets them know, hey, it's time to grow new feathers? The two main things that trigger it are an increased photo period, meaning the days are longer and their body somehow can tell, oh, there's more sunlight, ah, it's time to drop the feathers. And the other thing, of course, is more food. If, you, if they know, hey, I'm eating more food, I'm seeing more food available, that can trigger it and be like, bling, it's, it's time to molt. You can afford to burn those calories just towards growing new feathers. This is also true in captivity. If you want to give them, start the molt early, one of the things you can do is try to start fattening them up in the early spring months. Maybe they wouldn't have started molting until the beginning of summer, but because you fatten them up in February or March, their body can often be like, whoop, time to molt. And you need to make sure during the molt that they have as much water as possible available to them because you do have to have a lot of water to grow in new feathers. Now, as far as what to do with your bird, every bird is an individual and each species has a range of uh, complications. Some individual birds do best during the molt free lofted, which is, means they're in their mew, they're in their flight chamber, and you just have them loose and you basically let them go wild and they can fly and exercise and do whatever they want. And they do better that way. There are some birds that are the opposite, that actually do better during the molt if they have a perch and they're on a leash and they're like, oh, okay. I know a lot of falconers who don't work with their birds at all and their attitude is, hey, I don't want to disturb them for the risk of breaking feathers. I've done wildlife education for many years and so I love the idea of keeping my birds social all summer. And so I still, with, with the very few exceptions, most of my birds of prey, I will hold and handle all summer long still for social reasons. Now, one of the uh, problems you can run into, especially with, a, let's say, like a red-tailed hawk. You have a first-year red-tailed hawk. You have it in the mew, and you're, ah, you're just throwing food in there. They can become incredibly territorial of that mew because all you're doing is dumping food in there. You're like, oh, I'm just letting them fly and be free. Well, that can lead to incredible aggression and dangerous situations. So it's, I've mentioned this in some of my other videos. If you can, unless, unless you have a sponsor who recommends a different scenario, I, I like the best scenario of taking your bird out of the mew during the summer, walking them to another part of your yard, and on a leash, letting them hop down to food that is already there. So it's a lot harder for them to become territorial of your yard than it is for their mew based off of food being in there. And that gives you a little bit of social time, gets them out, and it keeps them from going into a baby mode. Because if you are just sitting in a, your, your mew, your flight pen, and you're just sitting here, and this person keeps bringing you food for a first year bird of prey, especially like a red-tailed hawk, their brain starts to think, wait a minute, I'm always in the same place and somebody's bringing me food without, I don't have to fly to it, I don't have to do a courtship dance for it, it just appears? Oh, it's mom. And if you watch some of my other videos, you've seen where I, I talk about the fact that 
mom and dad are feeding the babies and at a certain point the babies start becoming super aggressive and the parents will fly up and drop an injured animal for the babies to fly out and kind of a rudimentary training to learn how to hunt. If the parents stick around past that point, they're going to get attacked and killed by their babies. So they leave eventually. Well, if you are filling that role as a parent and have returned and their brains that even if with a non-imprint, they can start to have imprint-like behaviors and become aggressive. So I love the idea, and this is what I do with almost all my birds in the summer, is take them out, clip them on a leash, walk to another part of your yard, let them fly from your glove to food. And that um, reinforces your earlier season training of leaving your glove to catch prey. So this system works pretty well. Molting is important. And again, you have to know your bird, talk to other falconers and especially your sponsor if you're an apprentice to learn what for my species and for my individual bird, what is the best situation? Should I have a long, narrow flight pen just for the summer? Should I have them in the house? I have birds that I keep in the house. My, if any, When I'm flying jeer falcons, I have them in the house with me by an air conditioner all summer long. But there's another scenario that's kind of interesting, and that is called the reverse molt. Now, remember, the photo period in increased food tells a bird it's time to grow new feathers. But in there's situations where you might want them to molt in the winter and have their feathers in the summer. This is especially true. Now, I've done this in education work. If you have a flighted bird show that you display in the summertime outdoors, and it's not just on the fist, uh, you need those birds to have a nice full set of feathers. You can't manage their weight. You can't just have them be fat in the summer or they're not going to fly, and you can't have them skinny in the summer and, and ready to hunt, or else they're not going to grow their feathers properly. So what you want to do is reverse them so their body switches to time of year. So there's a couple ways you can do that. Uh, the first of all, let's say in, in the fall, you want them to start so they molt over the winter, stuff them like crazy, give them tons of additional food so they're nice and fat, and then put lights on them. Now, you just have to increase the photo period. I know people who will put plant grow lights over their bird. Some people will do a red light, and some people are like, hey, just regular old, light bulbs work. Some people say you need to increase it by a certain amount uh, it, during the day to, to lengthen the day each time. And some people like me, I've just gotten lazy over the years and I just have them in a room or in a meal with a light on and I just leave the light on. That combined with the food, increase in food, tells their body, oh, it's summertime, time to molt. So they'll molt over the winter, and by springtime, you have a nice new set of clean, perfect feathers, and you're ready to fly in educational programs. Now, there have been people who have introduced the idea of also doing a reverse molt for a hunt, particularly with sharp-shinned hawks. In the summertime, there are a lot of these non-native, invasive, destructive species that the government would love nothing more than for you to have your bird kill and eat like, again, uh, English sparrows and European starlings that ha are non-native here in America. So you can fly a bird. If you, if you get a baby sharp-shinned hawk, you can fly it for a few months in the early fall and then put it up in the molt, put it on lights, put it, fatten them up, and then let him molt over the winter. And by springtime, you've got a bird that you can fly all summer long. They do, they handle the heat well, as long as you uh, don't, don't keep them directly out in the sunlight too much but you know, let them cool off after hunt, then they still do just fine. And it actually can be a very fun form of falconry. You can do that in theory with any bird, but the people have been doing that a lot in the United States with sharp shin hawks on hunting these non-native birds. During the summer, you also have to be careful of the potential for any extra food to draw in insects. Now this could be as benign as ants, but wasps, yellow jackets, hornets love raw meat. Your bird is not that hungry in the summer because he's warm, he's fat. And so you might put the food out and it could attract wasps. And that could uh, potentially, if your bird goes to eat, those wasps might sting your bird, which is, that's a, that's a hazard. There's a lot of things. It's good to have uh, hornet traps around your muse to you know, keep those populations down. But it's be wise watching how much you feed your bird and be wise making sure that they they consume all of it so that you're not attracting these pests that could inflict damage on your bird 
Now, in the old days, birds also had wanderlust. It was something uh, the European falconry texts always mentioned this, that, oh, in the summer, migration instinct kicks in with our peregrines and they want to wander up north. Now, I've never experienced that. I'm not a medieval European falconer. And I suspect back then where they didn't have digital scales and their weight management was not as tight, uh, that it's indeed possible that it could have just been once the temperatures got up, the birds were less responsive and more prone to wander around. And it wasn't necessarily that they were trying to migrate. Could have been. But either way, the general rule is falconry is a fall and a winter and an early springtime sport. And in the summertime, we let all the prey species raise their young. We let our birds take the summer off. We fatten them up. We let them uh, enjoy a nice shaded mew and have water and food and grow a nice clean set of feathers. So with any of this, again, it's wise, especially your sponsor is going to know your area. So it's wise to always get the advice of your sponsor on the best way to deal with hot temperatures, the best food sources to use during the summer, and the best setup for your bird. But I hope this uh, brief information helps you understand getting through the molt. And again, if you have any other videos you would like me to make, feel free to write those down in the comments and click, click subscribe on my channel. And as always, happy hawking. Thank you.